This is Dr. Mark Scheuer, Chief Medical Officer at Persist. In this video, I'll be dissecting an FFT spectrogram to demonstrate how it's created and what it shows. Here are two FFT spectrograms that depict the frequency characteristics of one hour of EEG from an obtunded patient in the ICU. The top graph shows an average of activity in the left hemisphere and the bottom from the right. Five seizures are evident, originating on the right. I'll discuss the particulars of these graphs later in this demonstration. First, what does the name FFT spectrogram mean? The FFT portion of the name abbreviates Fast Fourier Transform, which is the computationally efficient algorithm that splits the raw EEG signal into a series of sine waves that, when added together, approximate the original EEG trace. Like a prism splitting white light into its component spectrum, the FFT splits the EEG into its spectrum hence the term spectrogram. It's a graphically efficient way to depict the EEG spectrum derived from FFT analysis. To illustrate how this is done, I created a simplified set of signals and then ran an FFT analysis on them. Here the first three traces on the left are 100 microvolt peak-to-peak -peak sine waves. The first is a 3 hertz sine wave, the second 6 hertz, and the third 12 hertz. The fourth trace is white noise with an average amplitude of 60 microvolts peak-to-peak. The fifth trace is the mathematical combination of the other four. This trace represents something more akin to an actual EEG signal. Some of the delta range 3 hertz signal is visually evident, but the other signals are more intermixed and obscured. Fast activities are certainly evident, but just what frequencies are present is difficult to say based on visual inspection. On the right are line graphs representing the output of an FFT run on each signal. Frequency from 0 to 32 Hz is shown in the x-axis, and amplitude of the signal at any particular frequency is shown in the y-axis. A discrete peak at 3 Hz is seen for the 3 Hz sine wave trace. Similarly, peaks are evident at 6 Hz and 12 Hz, respectively, for the 6 and 12 Hz traces. The white noise trace shows fairly similar activity from 0 to 32 Hz. Of greatest interest for this demonstration is the FFT output for the final, more complex trace. Notice that three discrete peaks are evident. These occur at 3, 6, and 12 Hz and are superimposed on a lower amplitude spread of diffuse activity from 0 to 32 Hz. The FFT has successfully split the EEG-like signal into its underlying components. This is just what happens with the EEG signals. Here I'm showing two EEG traces recorded from the left and right occipital regions of a person undergoing intermittent photic stimulation. A 6 Hz photic stimulus is turned on at the start of this EEG page, and a well-developed 6 Hz driving response follows. A line graph of an FFT spectrum obtained from 4 seconds of the driving response is shown on the right. As before, frequencies from 0 to 32 Hz are shown on the y-axis. Clear dominant amplitude peaks at 6 Hz are present on both the left and right. Now let's look at the EEG and its accompanying FFT line spectrum throughout the entire photic stimulation run. I'll scroll through the EEG second by second, and on the right you'll see the simultaneous FFT line spectrum derived from four-second EEG epochs. Notice how peaks of spectral power appear and disappear at the various photic flash frequencies as the photic stimulator is turned on and off. Now that all went by pretty fast, and although interesting to see it was hard to appreciate the particulars in the FFT spectrum graphs. A more easily appreciated representation of the FFT spectra can be created by stacking the FFT line graphs one behind the other, slightly offset, to create a 3D-like graph called a Hidden Line Compressed Spectral Array, or CSA for short. Here I've shown the FFT spectra from successive 4-second EEG epochs obtained over about 2.5 minutes of intermittent photic stimulation. Now the amplitude peaks accompanying 3, 6, 8, 10, 12, 15, and 20 Hz photic stimuli are clearly evident on the z-plane of this graph. Other interesting information is evident in this graphical representation of the EEG spectrum. At several flash frequencies, such as 8, 10, and 12 Hz, clear secondary harmonic peaks are also present. A CSA begins to approach the compact depiction of the FFT spectra provided by the spectrogram. If, instead of representing the FFT spectrum by a line graph, we substitute a color scale to represent the amplitude of the graph on the z-axis, a spectrogram results. This is also sometimes called a density spectral array, or DSA. 
Here's a DSA of the same data just shown in the CSA. Now a grayscale pixel represents the amplitude of the line that was previously shown as a vertical deflection on the Z scale. Black and dark gray shades indicate little to no amplitude at a particular frequency, whereas light grays and white indicate more amplitude, as shown on the scale at the upper right. This approach to FFT data visualization provides a clear picture of the successive frequency-locked peaks of EEG amplitude that accompany the brain's photic driving response. Dimmer-associated harmonic peaks are also seen. The color scheme used to represent the z-axis scale can easily be changed. Here an RGB scale, also sometimes called a rainbow scale, is used to represent the same data. This is a color scale convention that's commonly used in the presentation of FFT spectrograms. It tends to enhance small amplitude differences due to the largely arbitrary nature of the colors assigned to ascending points on the scale. The representation of the density spectral array seen here still differs in a significant way from our mind's picture of the standard representation of an EEG tracing. In an EEG recording, time proceeds from left to right on the x-axis. The DSA, too, can easily be brought into this orientation by rotating it so that time is represented as flowing from left to right on the x-axis. The y-axis then shows ascending frequency. Thus, the orientation and configuration of the standard EEG FFT spectrogram is achieved, as shown in this image visualizing the photic stimulation run responses from the left occipital region. Driving responses are seen at 1, 3, 6, 8, 10, 12, 15, and 20 hertz. Harmonic driving responses are also seen. Some of the patient's background alpha activity, running about 8 Hz, is also evident in the latter portion of the photic run. Now let's shift back to a time axis duration more typical of that used for continuous EEG trend monitoring. Here's a 20 minute view of the FFT spectrograms from the same recording that we've just been studying. The upper graph shows data from T5 to O1 and the lower graph from T6 to O2. An RGB color scale is used for the z-axis, and frequency from 0 to 30 hertz is shown on the y-axis. Now that 10 times more information is being graphed, are the brain's responses to intermittent photic stimulation still evident? Yes, the changes accompanying the driving responses are still readily seen near the right edge of the graphs. A quick glance allows their identification. This is what makes this graphical representation of the FFT analysis so appealing as a tool for monitoring ongoing prolonged EEG recordings. Fairly brief changes in the frequency makeup of the EEG, as well as longer term changes, are usually readily apparent. Before returning to the original clinical example presented at the start of the session, let's consider one more important aspect of the anatomy of an FFT spectrogram. Scaling. There are three primary scale parameters of importance, those for the x, y, and z axes. I just touched on the x-axis time scale. Like the EEG time axis, the spectrogram's time base can be adjusted as needed to show a longer or shorter period of time. For the y-axis frequency scale, I usually set the range from 0 to 20 Hz. I do this because almost all scalp-recorded EEG activity above 20 Hz is related to muscle activity during long-term EEG trending. There is usually little cerebral signal lost by restricting the display to 20 Hz and below, and extracerebral muscle noise is substantially reduced. Despite this, much muscle noise is still evident in the 10 to 20 Hz range. The z-axis is sometimes more difficult to scale appropriately. The amplitude of the EEG activity at a particular frequency can range from very low to very high, and so, depending on scaling choices, some high amplitude activity may exceed the upper end of the scale chosen, or a good deal of low amplitude EEG activity may be pegged at the lower end of the scale. Ideally, the z-scale chosen for a particular patient will have enough dynamic range to allow good representation of both high and low amplitude patterns.